Okay. Hello, everyone. The enjoyment of leisure time is an important part of the human experience. And yet most scholarship concerned with, the leisure, in the, with leisure in the Roman world focuses on theatres, amphitheatres, and races in the circus. In other words, the public forms of entertainment sponsored by those at the very apex of society. Board games, a potential bottom-up, do-it-yourself kind of leisure activity, have received comparatively little attention, though this is now beginning to change. Today, I'm going to present an update on our examination of gaming boards in Roman Britain and focus on those, on some of those at least, found along Hadrian's Wall. This is still a work in progress as we're looking to tie up some loose ends, which have remained loose due to the recent pandemic's impact on collection access, but I ho still hope that we'll have some important and interesting insights to share. I'll start by reviewing key aspects of past scholarship on gaming in the Roman world in general, and Britain in particular. I'll then take a quick look at the type of gaming boards represented in Roman Britain and briefly summarize the data from across the whole of the province to provide some background for the boards from Hadrian's Wall. I'll then focus on some partially po uh, published boards from Hadrian's Wall, most notably from Vindolanda and from the sector near Sycamore Gap, which we've been granted the privilege of studying um, in the past year or so. Um, before turning to, and then I will turn to some wider considerations about the distribution of boards in Britain and their implications for the introduction of gaming to the province. There is a general tendency for historians to associate board gaming with urban contexts. Colleagues like nurse Nicholas Purcell and Jerry Toner have done some excellent work examining the place of board games in, the, in Roman urban environments around the Mediterranean. Though I am not going to look at this in detail today, save to say that this work is not particularly revealing of social practices in the Northwestern provinces and Britain in particular, where the army pays a bigger role in society. Turning to Britain, important work has been done by the Rural Settlement of Roman Britain project, which provided a first look at the distribution of gaming related finds, including boards, dice and counters across the province. This project mapped a huge number of sites in the British countryside, many only semi-published or available in grey literature reports. And their data appears to show that the, the evidence for gaming and other leisure activities in the Roman countryside of Britain was limited. The project also found that sites with gaming paraphernalia clustered near to sites which can be related to the military. This is a very useful starting point for our analysis, but the project's focus on broader questions of settlement patterns meant that an exhaustive list of gaming boards, both published and unpublished, could not be compiled. We've been working to pull together a fuller list of boards with the hope that this can start to inform us about the types of games being played and the experience of board game players in Roman Britain. As I say, until now, as far as we are aware, no attempt has been made to collect all known gaming boards from Roman Britain. We aim to meet this gap in research by using a range of complementary data sources. I'm not going to describe these in detail, but I would like to take a moment now to thank all of the colleagues, some of whom may be listening, uh, for their help in assembling our corpus. Um, so far, I've done quite a bit of talking about gaming boards without actually showing any from Britain. Um, but since this is a Roman finders group meeting, I think it's about time that we have a look at some of the British evidence. Three main types of gaming board are present in Britain. And I'll briefly, over, I'll briefly review these while showing some examples from across the province. The first kind of board comprises grid boards akin to a modern checkerboard in stone or in tile. Numerous boards of this type exist across the Roman world with the common configurations including seven by eight uh, squares, eight by eight squares, and nine by 10 squares. While this could reflect their use for different games, we should remember that standard rules and sets for gaming are modern notions seated in modern mass manufacturing practices so this question must remain unanswered. There is a traditional scholarly association with this kind of board and the war game known as Ludus Latrunculi, mentioned in several classical authors. I can't go into, in, into detail now about the, the rules of the game, but the aim seems to have been to surround one's opponent's pieces with two of your own and eventually wipe out his or her army. Um, it's worth noting that um, these boards that can actually be surprisingly difficult to um, uh, to identify because um, uh, uh, there have been a few flutiles that we've seen published um, scored with diamond shaped grids uh, published as gaming boards um, but we've excluded these from our sample because um, though they could have been used for boards it's quite possible they were simply used um, for um, heating in the baths um, 
that said, we shouldn't view the um, we should view this this misidentification as a symptom of the lack of detailed typologies of gaming boards, um, rather than a failing of uh, the individual colleagues who um, identified them as such. Um, returning to securely identified examples, um, on the basis of securely identified examples alone, these boards are by far the most common across the whole of Britain, making up more than three quarters of our data set. This may reflect their easy manufacture or the range of games that were played on them. Backgammon type games, including Ludus Duodecim Scriptorum and Alea, are race games in which players advance their teams towards the finishing line. Some of the minutiae of the rules remain unclear, but conceptually these games are not dissimilar from medieval and modern backgammon, of which they may be the ancestors. We have an example of this board game from Holt in Denbyshire on the left in this slide, um, and another example from Castle Nick on Hadrian's Wall, but I'll return to the Castle Nick piece later. These boards are relatively rare in Britain, with only a handful of known stone examples, as can be seen in our piece published in the Roman Finance Group newsletter last year. It's worth noting, however, that backgammon games of this type may have been played on wooden boards of rectangular shape identified in several graves across southern Britain, and so the limited representation of this board game type may be a product of the materials used. The third and final type of board known in Britain is Merrill's, also known as, third, as three, six, or nine men's Morris. In this space game, players take turns to place and subsequently move their three, six, or nine pieces with the aim of lining them up either horizontally, vertically, or diagonally. The first player to do so wins. We know from textual sources that this game was played in the Roman world, um, the circulation in Britain is actually a bit problematic. Um, the example shown on the left here is from Corbridge and was identified by Bell in the 1970s, but no stratigraphic information is available to date it, so it could equally be medieval, not Roman. Um, similarly, the design shown on the right has been associated by some scholars with circular merrills, um, though this has been forcefully rejected in a thoughtful article by Ulrich Schadler at the Swiss Museum of Games. Other alternative interpretations include a sort of uh, nut throwing game or use for divination. In total, we found 111 gaming boards across the whole of Roman Britain from 55 sites. I'm not going to delve into the numbers in too great detail now, but it suffices to note that the majority of sites with gaming boards are military in nature, and there is a roughly even split between the remaining urban and rural sites with gaming boards. These British figures are very modest when compared with the Mediterranean, where sites often return dozens or even hundreds of boards. Um, for example, at Aphrodisias in, in Turkey, um, one, uh, one area known as the South Agora or the Place of Palms has a total of 510 gaming boards. Um, so really, this utterly dwarfs the number of boards known from Britain. Um, the small British figures may partly reflect the archaeological invisibility of gaming boards made of wood, felt, or leather, or situations where individuals were playing on, on boards scratched into the mud. But it may also suggest that board gaming in public spaces of the kind known in the Mediterranean was not as prevalent in Britain, perhaps due to the often inclement weather of our rainy island. Um, the greater overall number of gaming boards known from military sites hint at a role, hints at the role of soldiers in moving knowledge of board games around the empire. And I'm going to come back to this theme later, but first of all, let's just talk about soldiers and games a little bit more. The connection between Roman soldiers and board games has been discussed since at least the late 19th century, when Rudolfo Lanciani drew the connection between a board found in the north of Rome and the nearby Castro Pretorio. In Britain and the Northwest provinces, numerous scholars have commented on the popularity of games among military communities, including R.G. Austin in the 1930s, and far more recently, Lindsay Allison Jones, Andrew Burley, David Brees, Sonia Yilek, and many others. Um, this connection has, been, has also been stressed in relation to, ga um, to gaming at site level in Germany and Egypt. And we have two lovely texts um, from each of these areas, both authored by soldiers. Um, the first, a wax tablet recovered from a midden in the legionary fortress of Vindenissa in modern Switzerland, sees a soldier invite a comrade for a meal, at which there will be plentiful wine and various games. As we can see on this slide, he then goes on to boast about his ability at dicing, which will be taking part uh, at, the, uh, at the dinner. Um, the second text is an ostracon written by a soldier named Juventius stationed uh, at a minor fort 
uh, sorry, written to a soldier named Juventus, stationed at a minor fort in Egypt, Egypt's eastern desert. The Ostracon's author um, had apparently been asked by Juventus to purchase dice, but, appa but apparently none were available. Comoros, the, the author, is writing to inform Juventus about his failure to purchase the items requested, which are clearly an important part of soldierly life. So the attraction of soldiers and wider military communities uh, to gaming might be explained in several ways. A desire to indulge in bravado and an opportunity to demonstrate one's own skill and intelligence, for example. Or the thrill of risk, especially if we allow that gaming uh, or gambling, uh, gambling on the outcome of games might sometimes have been involved. However, we should also entertain the possibility that there was simply a need to pass the time and while away the long, boring hours that might form part of military life um, or life in a military community. This last possibility also seems to emerge from some cross-cultural work on gaming, and I'd particularly like to thank Barbara Burley here for, th for highlighting a possible gaming board incised in a slab outside a guard tower, shown here on the right, um, along another wall, that is, the Great Wall of China, indicating that this fight against boredom is perhaps not restricted to the Roman world alone. Okay. If we look at the distribution, uh, distribution plot of gaming boards from military sites across the whole of Britain, it's clear that some of these sites um, are spread around Wales and the south, but the vast majority of them um, are around Hadrian's Wall and its immediate hinterland. Gaming boards appear at major forts, at mile castles and fortlets along the wall, as well as at sites on the Solway Firth and at Corbridge. The distribution is uneven uh, with, along the wall, with more finds attested in the central and eastern sectors, um, and I'd be interested to hear if anybody has any thoughts as to what might explain this. It may just be the ready availability of stone, but um, I'm, not a, I'm prim not primarily a scholar of Hadrian's Wall, so I would really appreciate some feedback on that. Um, so moving forward, I don't, have any, I don't have enough time today to present every single board from each site um, along Hadrian's Wall. And for a full list, I would urge uh, anybody interested to read our piece in the most recent RFG, uh, sorry, in last year's um, RFG newsletter because um, the number, the overall numbers from the war have not changed very much. But today I'm going to focus on a few case study sites and the gaming boards found at them to allow us to get to grips with the material evidence in greater detail. Gaming boards were probably not just used by soldiers, but also by the communities attached to forts, as the case of Vinderlander demonstrates. Andrew Burley has mapped six gaming boards, as well as a large number of gaming counters from the fort and its vicus, as these two maps show. Boards are represented by the green dots. Um, 16 possible boards are now known from Vindelander, and I would like to thank, thank the Vindelander Trust for allowing us uh, very kindly to um, examine these last autumn. I've not reproduced a plan of the fine spots here, as some of these are from recently excavated areas that aren't published, but I can say that their distribution largely mirrors that of Andrew Burley's earlier mapping project with further boards both within and without the fort. We cannot say with certainty who used these boards, but it is likely that their location all over the site indicates that both soldiers and civilian members of this military community would have been familiar with and probably practiced board gaming. I'd now like to spend a few moments to look at some of the boards from Rindelander in more detail. As I've already said, a total of 16 possible examples are recorded from the site to date. All of these are gridded boards, three of which are made of tile and 13 of stone. The tile boards are quite difficult to identify securely, though they all seem to be broadly of the same type represented by the item on the bottom left. Uh, so as you note, there's not a diamond pattern typical of uh, scoring of tiles, flue tiles. Um, there's considerably more variation in the quality and execution of boards made on stone slabs, as you can see in the remaining images on this slide. These, these range from well-executed pieces with clearly defined edges, like that on the bottom right here, uh, through to roughly edged examples with unclear edges like that on the top right. The boards also range considerably in thickness and therefore in weight with implications for their portability. Two of the examples on the, on the far right um, weighed more than five kilograms each, perhaps suggesting that they were not intended to be moved very far. Some of the other examples, whether in tile or in stone, are considerably thinner and therefore presumably would have had been a fair bit lighter. Though unfortunately, none are completely preserved, so it's not possible to establish their exact weights. We might think that this allowed them to be more portable and be used in a wider range of areas uh, to allow some kind of flexibility in space uh, used for gaming. 
Um, but these variations in board quality should probably be viewed in light of the distribution both within and without the fort, and they should be taken to indicate the widespread playing of board games are, um, across, among the Vinterlander community, including those with time and skill to invest in high, higher quality carving, though we should not assume that all of those with higher status automatically had the highest quality gaming equipment. The poorly incised board on the top right, which I already drew your attention to, is in fact from a fourth century lair which comprises the final surface of the Decurian's apartment floor. We'll explore this idea in print in more, uh, in more detail in future, but it seems that the nature of gaming at Vindolanda was often an improvised one, and I think this can be, more, this can be generalized to many of the gaming boards from Roman Britain. Um, a range of different experiences were on offer for different members of commu the community. The area between Castle Nick that is Mile Castle 39, and Sycamore Gap has also returned a significant number of gaming boards. With the exception of the board illustrated in the bottom right, these have not yet been published, and I would like to thank Edinburgh's Professor Jim Crow for allowing us to study them. The catalogue prepared at the time of the excavation records at least six grid boards found in the area, all described as roughly cut, suggesting they were, th these were made in haste and not necessarily kept for a long time. The high number of boards in such a small area may also indicate that boards were sometimes discarded and or replaced by successive generations of soldiers stationed on this part of the wall. In addition to these grid boards, one fragmentary board with four small circles and one large, large circle, so this could be seen in the center here, uh, forms part of a duodecim scriptor or a layer board. This is the backgammon type game that I talked about earlier, um, suggesting that a variety of games were being played at Castle Nick. So even in this relatively remote part of the Roman Empire, soldiers were engaging with ideas and games popular in its urban core. Another interesting board uh, found at Sycamore Gap, an area shown on the right of, uh, is shown on the right of this slide. This board in three fag fragments was found inside a collapse and had been broken and used in the core of the wall. This find probably reflects army laborers, including stonemasons, using the board during their leisure hours while reconstructing a sector of the wall. Uh, while well, constructing a sector of the wall, only to, to discard it as too cumbersome to take with them when they moved on to the next camp. This particular board also undermines the familiarity of soldiers with stoneworking, meaning they were able to make enduring stone boards. It's worth noting at this stage that the high visibility of gaming boards in Britain, uh, in Hadrian's Wall, along Hadrian's Wall in particular, may in part be to the use of durable, durable uh, materials in their manufacture in this area. But an additional explanation may be that the high mobility of elements of the Roman army encouraged the transfer of ideas. And I'll now explore this idea a little bit um, in a little bit more detail within the context of scholarship on the introduction of Roman style board gaming into Britain. The earliest possible evidence for Roman style board gaming in Britain comprises a group of graves which contain gaming sets and which um, either slightly predate the Roman conquest of Britain or were deposited shortly afterwards. Earlier evidence for gaming in Britain is known in the first century BCE grave from Whirlwind Garden City, but it's unclear whether this relates to a Roman board game, and I'm not going to talk about it today. Um, of the board games which, or gaming sets which date slightly closer to the con uh, Roman conquest of Britain, the most famous is possibly the, um, that known as the Doctor's Grave um, from Stanway. It takes its name from the items of medical paraphernalia which appeared alongside the gaming set. The set itself comprised a wooden board with metal fittings. Um, though the wood does not survive, the placement of these fittings, along with two sets of gaming counters in blue and white, make it probable that we're dealing with a gaming board. The interpretation of this particular board is highly disputed. It could be an imported Roman game or a local development, and there is still no scholarly consensus on this matter. Um, one of the key issues at stake here is the nature of gaming and play itself, which must be situated within broader sociological debates. Work by Hutzinger in the middle of the 20th century and followed in relation to the doctor's grave by Ulrich Schädler suggests that gaming, game playing is a natural human activity arising independently in many societies. Schädler therefore suggests that this grave may attest to a native Celtic permutation of gaming within the British Isles. Other scholars have seen gaming as a specific cultural activity which arose in Egypt or the Levant before being disseminated across the globe. Drawing on this tradition, Hall and Forsyth suggested that early game, gaming boards in Britain are testament to cultural contracts between pre-Roman Britain and the empire on the continent. Both of these approaches 
imply that the introduction of board gaming took place in a single wave. In other words, the early adopters of board games that we see at places like Stanway were responsible for the passing on of this knowledge to other parts of the Romano British population. However, multiple transmission routes for board games into Britain are possible and do not necessarily need to be mutually exclusive. There is now a general consensus that the Roman Empire was a time of exceptional mobility of people both within and across its frontiers. Time doesn't permit me to review the, the evidence in detail, but it suffices to note that a growing body of evidence based on isotopic analysis, epigraphic evidence, and artifactual studies has begun to illustrate the ways in which archaeology can contribute to our understanding of migration in the past. This work has also demonstrated that military communities enjoyed high levels of, of population mobility. The, um, the movement of people is inextricably linked to the movement of knowledge. In particular, arrival of individuals from elsewhere in the empire to the province of Britannia facilitated the arrival of new kinds of material culture, as well as new ideas. This is still a concept which we're seeking to develop, but a quick look at the distribution of boards shows that most of the military sites with boards are in the north, and many are on or near Hadrian's Wall, while others, mostly urban and rural sites, are far to the south. This isn't to say that there was no interaction between uh, military communities and those living in rural and urban environments, but um, we might ask whether, um, uh, but we might also take um, another view. The high number of gaming boards on Hadrian's Wall may suggest that soldiers and other members of military communities served as an alternative vector of transmission for knowledge about games and gaming. And gaming. Some members of the military would have been born in other parts of the empire and probably picked up habits such as gaming and gambling in their youth before relocating in Britain, uh, relocating to Britain. So to sum up the work we've done so far, first of all, we don't think a text-driven, urban-centric view of gaming is helpful for Britain, as board games were clearly extremely popular among military communities. Um, although, the and although the fact that um, soldiers played games has been considered by earlier scholars, greater weight should be placed on soldiers as vectors for moving around ideas, both about board games and perhaps more generally. Um, that just about wraps up everything I've got to present today, but at this point, I'd just like to thank many Roman Fines Group members and other colleagues who've got in touch and offered comments uh, or further data, as well as staff from the European Research Fund, uh, Council funded Locus Ludi project at the University of Fribourg in Switzerland, for providing detailed feedback on an earlier version of this paper. Thanks also go to the Roman Fines Group, uh, to the Vinderlander Trust, to Historic England, and for, to Jim Crow for allowing us to uh, examine um, unpublished gaming boards. And I'd just also like to thank everybody here today for tuning in and taking the time to listen to my paper. Thank you very much. <laughs>